soft. What have you been eating? Well, farting is completely natural. It's just your body's way of getting rid of unwanted built-up gas, and everyone does it about 14 times a day. It doesn't matter if we're talking about your head teacher or the queen herself. We all do it, and it's honestly not your fault. He is actually right there. Inside your large intestines, there are millions of good bacteria that are there to help break down food. And as they eat, they produce a mixture of gases, which is what makes you let rip. This combination of gases is made up mainly of air, carbon dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, and methane. And the methane contains a lot of energy, as we're about to show you. And for this, I'm going to need a special piece of equipment. Chris's hand. Now this is a cylinder of methane, and I'm going to release one day's worth of farts. This experiment is highly dangerous. We're in a controlled lab using specially manufactured gas. Don't even think about trying this yourself. Get your hand wet. Now scoop up those bubbles. That's right. Hold them well away from you. I don't like the look of this. Ah! Oh! So that was amazing. So that's how much energy there is in a day's worth of farts. Exactly. That's one day's worth of farts. Well, you know what we have to do now? A week's worth. Precisely. One week's worth of farts. <laughs> That's really good, isn't it? So we've done a day, we've done a week. Dare we do a month? Yes, we do. Dare. Do it. Here we go. Ice it. Wow! That was amazing. Wow! Oh. So we've shown you just how incredible your intestines are and how much energy there is in your farts. Remember, when you let rip, it's an essential part of how your body gets rid of excess gas. The reason Chris is on the bike is because I want him to try and heat up this beaker of water to exactly 37 degrees Celsius. I think I got the short straw here. My bike is actually generating electricity to heat up the water in that beaker. Do you need a rest, Chris? Oh, yeah, thanks. Be kind of a rest! Come on, keep going! It's 35, 35 and a half, 36, 36.5, 37! Perfect, you can stop. Oh, you've overshot. It's up at 38. Sorry, I'm going to have to add a load of ice and then we'll start all over again. That's good, keep going. Now, 37 degrees isn't just any old random temperature we've plucked out of the air. It's the temperature of your body's core, which is this bit here, where all your internal organs are. Oi. You don't need to prod me. So your organs work best at 37 degrees and your body tries to keep your insides at exactly this temperature. You know what? I've had enough. I think I have clearly demonstrated that trying to keep something at constant temperature is hard work, but your amazing body does it every day without you even noticing it. And no matter what you throw at it, as we're about to show you. Today, we're going into battle with our own bodies see if we can get our core body temperatures to change. It's time for Chris and Zand versus our core body temperatures. Snappy name, Zand. Thank you. Now, we can only do this experiment because we're doctors and it's being done in very controlled conditions. For this battle, Zand is going to sit in a super hot bath for 10 minutes. While Chris will sit in an ice bath for 10 minutes. He'll be freezing and I'll be boiling. But will it affect our core temperature? Let's find out. So I shall be Captain Cryogenic. I shall be Dr. Warm. Dr. Warm? Is that the best you can do? I think it's quite a good name for a core body temperature fighting superhero. What's so great about Captain Cryogenic anyway? Well, for a start, the words Captain and Cryogenic both begin with the same letter. Hmm. OK, so we're ready to go. It's time to try and beat our core body temperatures. Let battle commence! Oh, oh. So Chris gets into his ice bath. Oh, oh. While Zand pops into the toasty warm bath. This is hot. We've already taken our core temperatures and we've both got a reading of 37.7 degrees Celsius. Now, to do this experiment properly, we've put special super accurate thermometers inside our bodies. Can you guess where they are? Is it A? in our armpits, B in our stomachs, or C up our bottoms? The answer is C, but don't be alarmed, they're coming out as soon as all this is over. Remember, we can only do this because we're doctors. Now we're getting out and about with our mobile clinic. 
Today, we're at a theme park to help solve your medical mysteries. If you're anxious about an ailment, or curious about a condition, then the Ouchmobile is the place for you. That is incredible. Zand is preparing the clinic, ready for his patients. And later, he'll be out in the park to answer your burning questions. At the clinic, Zand is open for business. Can I have the next patient? First in is nine-year-old Byron, with a question about some interesting bumps on his body. So, Byron, why have you come to the Ouchmobile today? To show my warts and my warts on here. You've got two warts. Um, and then they won't go away. What's the diagnosis, Doc? Ah, sounds to me like a case of I've got a wart on my thumb and I've got a wart on my foot and they won't go away itis. Double trouble. Let's have your thumb here. Now that is just an absolutely classic wart. Can we have a look at the one on your foot? Does it hurt at all? No. What can you do about warts? Well, a lot of warts just go away on their own, but some people, they don't like the way they look or they take a long time to go away. In that case, you can either put some chemicals on and that will get rid of them, or you can use a freezing treatment and that breaks the cells in the warts and means the warts die and go away. But as long as you have got a wart, although it's not really a problem, you don't want to spread them on to other people. So if you go swimming, you want to put a sticky plaster over the wart on your thumb and one out on the one on your foot, and that will stop them spreading. At the clinic, he's open for business. Can I have the next patient? First in is eight-year-old Zoe, with a question about some bendy bits on her body. So Zoe, why have you come to the Ouchmobile? Because I've got a really bendy body. What's the diagnosis, Doc? This sounds like a case of, I've got a really bendy body-itis. That's what I'd say. Can I have a look at what you can do? I can to bend my arm all the way around. Oh, well, I think I can do that. Oh, wait a minute. You're doing a thumbs up while I'm doing a thumbs down? Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. What else can you do? Touch my elbows behind my back. OK, I can at least do this one. Are they touching? Are no. they close? No. Oh. Why do I bend so much and my friends don't? What you've got is a thing called hypermobility. Most of the time, your joints are held in place by things called ligaments, and they're like very tough elastic bands that keep the bones together. Now, those ligaments are mostly made of something called collagen, and in most people, the collagen is quite tough, but for you, it's a bit more flexible, it's a bit stretchier, and that means that your joints can move a little bit more. It doesn't do you any harm, though, but it does mean that you're a bit more bendy than other people. It's time for competitive <coughs> coughing. What is going on? Well, I've made these cutouts that look just like you and me. They don't and look they... anything like me. They're all blue. I'm the green twin. Everything I wear is green. It's greenish. It's, it's not, does that look the same? It's turquoise. It doesn't look anything alike. It's not relevant, aren't the point is, I've put plates full of a special scientific gunk called agar jelly on the faces of our cutouts. So if any bacteria happen to land on any of our plates, they're going to multiply so much we can actually see them. OK, Chris, you ready? Three, two, one, cough! We're doing two experiments, one where the plates are 10 centimetres away and another where they're 50 centimetres away. <laughs> well, all done. Not quite, Chris. I want you to take this agar plate and hold it in front of your face, and I'm going to cough on it. And this time, I'm going to cover my mouth with my elbow the way you're supposed to, and hopefully no germs should land on the plate. OK, we'll just make sure you do it properly. <coughs> and now, we have to wait. In lab conditions, bacteria take some time to grow. Luckily, we came prepared for a long wait. And finally, the test results are in. So let's check out the cutouts that were 50 centimetres away first. Oh, yuck! This has worked really well. All these bacteria have grown into thick, furry, yucky blooms. Ugh. Well, let's have a look at mine. Oh, they're even worse than Zant. Mine are also growing in horrible, slimy, furry green colonies. And all this from just one cough. Now for the cutouts that were only 10 centimetres away. Oh, this is even worse. There's loads of furry stuff in here. Oh, that is disgusting. Let's have a look at mine. Oh, there's a huge bacterial splat in the middle of the plate. I must have coughed up a lot of saliva with that one. So 
So this is like coughing into someone's face when they're right next to you. And that's bad news for them when you realize that the average cough has 20,000 viruses in it. Which brings me to our last result. Let's have a look at the plate where I covered my mouth and coughed at Chris. Oh, two bacteria. I knew you hadn't covered your mouth properly. I think you can see, though, that this is a lot better than the other ones we did. So, there you have it. In case you were in any doubt about whether or not to cover your mouth when you cough, we've shown that not only could your cough reach the person right next to you, but it could travel a lot further than that. Yuck. And as well as seeing how far they travel, we've shown you just how much bacteria there can be in coughs. Lots of emergency cases arrive at Alderhay and other hospitals by air. All over the UK, there are helicopter services ready to help. Today's hospital hero is London Air Ambulance pilot, Captain Neil Jeffers. And we're going to meet him. Well, Chris is late. I've got no idea where he is at all, but Captain Neil is not going to be pleased, and this is a little bit embarrassing. There's Zondi. Where is he? Come on, Chris. Oh, it's a shame he's missed this. Probably should have told him about it. The helicopter's here. The blades have stopped turning and it's safe to approach. Ah, hi, Zand. Sorry you missed that. It really is the only way to travel. I'm going to start getting a helicopter to work a bit more often. This is outrageous. I've been giving Chris lots of tea because I want to use his bladder to show you what happens when we empty it. I'm going to use an ultrasound so that we can see what Chris's bladder looks like now that it's full. Now, what you're looking at here, these top layers are Chris's tummy muscles, and then below here, this big black blob, that's all of Chris's bladder. It's full of clear liquid, which is urine. Now, the reason Chris needs to go so badly is because the sensors in his bladder wall are detecting all the stretching, and this is known as the micturition reflex, the point at which you really, really have to go. I think pretty confidently I can say that I'm about to feel the micturition reflex. All right, go ahead then. What? Here in the lab? Just this once, on one occasion, you're allowed to pee in the lab, Chris. I think I'd better, because I don't think I'm going to make it to the toilet. I'm going to hold the ultrasound scanner against my bladder while I'm weeing, so you can see it shrinking as I go to the loo. OK, Chris, let your micturition reflex go. We can see on the ultrasound that Chris's bladder is shrinking, and that's because the muscle fibres are pressing on the bladder, forcing the wee out. God, that's great. And you can't see his bladder anymore at all. Completely empty. Operation ouch. I've been bitten. The mosquitoes are ridiculous at this time of year. I know how you feel. Now, did you bring some antihistamine cream? Not by a mosquito, Chris. By a zombie! What's this? What happened? They came out of nowhere! They lunged at me! They must have smelt my blood! Oh, that's them now! Hmm. Zand, you might be right. This actually could be a zombie bite. If what I've read is true, the next thing that happens is that the infected, the infected area... area becomes more bruised and discoloured! And that is exactly what's happening. Fascinating. After a zombie bite, the first thing that happens is that the surrounding area becomes brown, like a bruise. That's because the zombie's blood has started to mix with my blood, and a zombie's blood is black. Well, Zan, the blood test would seem to confirm a case of being bitten by a zombie. I mean, look at this. It's completely pitch black. Pretty soon you're going to be cold to the touch. Now, where's my thermometer? Where have I put it? I must say, I'm beginning to feel a bit chilly. Well, I'm not surprised. I mean, look at you, Zand. Now stick this under your tongue. And the thermometer confirms it. Zand, you have no temperature at all. And that's because, like all zombies, my body isn't making heat anymore. I'm really no longer human. And oh, my eyes are beginning to itch a bit. Ah, now, this is interesting. This is a classic sign. What is? Have a look, Zand. Here's a mirror. Ooh. Inside your eyes, you have the retina at the back and then the iris at the front, which is the coloured bit. Unlike in humans, zombies' irises don't have any colour at all. Zand, how are you feeling? To be honest, I'm feeling a bit peckish. Well, that's not surprising, because, of course, the final stage of becoming a zombie is an overwhelming desire to eat human flesh! Ah! 
would you have treated someone during the First World War with a very badly broken leg? Basically, you'd use a Thomas splint. And the way this works is by re-knitting the bones together and using something called traction. If you break your leg very badly, the muscles around it pull the leg shorter and the bones overlap. Traction works by pulling the muscles back to allow the bones to be realigned. Stabilizing broken bones like this saved lives during the war as it meant blood loss could be controlled and there was a better chance of keeping infection out. It looks very uncomfortable to use, is that right? Yes, it's incredibly uncomfortable. Maybe Zon should have a go. Yeah, I think so. Brilliant, brilliant. All right, then. If you hold it straight. OK. OK. And we need to up through there. It's pretty difficult doing this kind of thing if we imagine him in the trenches covered in mud like this. And presumably, you'd be working with people shooting at us and shells landing around at the same time. Yeah. You're starting to see how difficult medicine would be in the trenches. You can see why you don't even bother to wash your hands beforehand. The mud gets into everything. So basically, as Richard's tightening there, this frame is now pushing in your groin, and the bones that are broken here will be being separated, and then they can grow back together normally. What's amazing is to see this being used in a replica of a World War I trench, and to think, I've used one of these in a modern emergency department. It's exactly the same thing. So how do you feel, Sand? Is it comfortable? It's not very comfortable for me, and it would be very painful if I really had a broken leg, but my leg is very well supported. It would also mean I'm much more likely to survive. To show you how your sensory neurons detect the difference between hot and cold, Zahn and I are going for a swim. Now, because the sea is cold, I've decided to pre-acclimatise, and I'm already pretty cold myself. Zand, on the other hand, has taken a different strategy. Zand? Now, my strategy is to get as warm as possible before I get in the freezing ocean. Come on, you've had enough time in there. Let's get going. Five more minutes, Chris. There's still a little warmth left in the hottie. Quite enough time. You've been in there an hour and a half. Give me that. Come on. It's freezing out here. OK, are you ready, Zan? I'm boiling. I can't wait to get in. All right, last one ends a rotten egg. Three, two, one. Ow. 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 Ah. This is embarrassing. Oh, lovely. <laughs> Tropical. Oh, why is your bit of ocean warmer than my bit of ocean? Have you peed there? No, don't be absurd. Sensory neurons work by detecting the difference in temperature between the water and your skin. There's hardly any difference between my cold skin and the cold water, so I feel fine. But for Zand, there's a big difference between his warm <laughs> skin and the cold water, so he feels extremely chilly. Once his skin temperature drops, he'll start to feel okay too. I must say now, it's absolutely lovely. Well, Zahn, that was a great success. Would you like an ice cream? Ooh, I'd love an ice cream. Just give me a second and I can get on my hat, my hoodie, my dressing gown, my blankie. Good luck finding your blankie. Bye. Chris! <laughs>